Hello, and welcome to the newest Extended Disc webinar. My name is Christina Bowser, and I am here with my boss, president, and CEO of Extended Disc, Marku Kalpanen. Welcome. Thank you, Christina. Good morning. Here we are again. Um, today, we're actually going to talk about, I think, a great subject. We get asked these questions a lot, and you know, a lot of us use these profiles, but is there more that we, we can understand or better understand about them? So, um, this will re be recorded as always. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, what do you want to tell us about extended disc profiles, Mark? Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, well, really what I want to talk about is the profiles is to give a kind of a quick overview and, and maybe refresh for some of the audience members. I don't intend this to be a certification training or, or anything like that, but I, I think I will be able to give a couple of new pieces of information that I hope artist members will uh, find valuable, uh, something that I, I think sometimes people miss when interpreting the profiles. But again, I'm going to keep it big picture. Uh, as you know, Christina, profiles have, they provide a lot of information and there are levels of interpretation when it comes to profiles. And, and uh, we are not going to talk all about those. Maybe we save that topic for a later webinar. But again, I want to kind of give you a quick overview of what we are talking about and how to interpret them. And um, as I always do, I want to have a starting point. And starting point for thinking about the profiles is, again, to remember that extended disk is not a test. And the reason I mentioned that in this webinar is that when we look at the profiles, ultimately, we want to see a very valid profile. And in practice, that means that the person who's answering those 24 questions must be consistent in their responses. And when we use the word test and asking people to complete this test, that really is a distraction because they think that there are some types of right or wrong answers. And when they're trying to provide right or wrong answers instead of their own answers, that are just honest gut reactions to those words, um, often they get a little confused and we tend to not to get as valid results. So please always stay away from the word test. Yeah, it gets that tense motion in us when we hear that word sometimes. Yeah, and there really are no right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. And and second thing is that is is that there we go. That what the profiles identify is uh, a particular profile too is the hardwired behavioral style, who the person really is. We do look at how the person perceives they need to how they need to adjust presently in their work environment, but the main focus is who the person really is, that hardwired behavioral style. And then, then also, I want everybody to kind of think about the DISC as a diagnostic assessment. So it's kind of like if you think of being a doctor, you are using, let's say, MRI or X-ray. Those are diagnostic tools to help us to identify what's causing the pain, so to speak. And the reason I want to mention that is that when we are using any type of diagnostic tool, if it's a doctor interpreting an MRI image or us interpreting the profiles, we need to, again, think about the validity of the results before we jump into conclusions. I just want to say one thing. We are getting a couple questions, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning. We won't be able to answer them during the time because we're so time limited, but I promise you we will answer them after. And, yes, the slides will be available. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. So, so and, and then also, when we look at profiles, like I mentioned, there are levels of interpretation. Like sometimes it might be enough for us to know that I'm a D style or I'm a DI. That may be perfectly enough because we are trying to just kind of get to the surface level of how I can better modify my communication style, for example. But we should always remember that all of us are a combination of all of these four D styles. And I can kind of show you how we can get that information from the profiles. And to truly, to truly understand someone, we need to look at the relationship among all four D styles when we're interpreting the profiles. So you're talking about just different layers. At some levels, very quick, I just need to know he's a D. And then at other levels, I need to know he's a DI. I need to know more information about him. So you're just saying that, you know, we need there's different levels in which people can use disc exactly and and we can even get to so deep as to look at what are some underlying feelings that mm. the individual might be experiencing be it uncertainty frustration stress all of those kind of things you can interpret from the profiles a lot of times you really you're not in an appropriate setting or you don't have the time exactly. to have those kind of interpretations and you really should not go that deep in fact i kind of have to rule that when you're using the information from the extended disk assessment, go only as deep as you need to. Don't go too deep because 
let's say you don't have a whole lot of time to review the assessment results, and if the participants are left somehow confused, when people are confused, they are not going to take the information and use it to modify behavior. And that's what we're ultimately hoping to achieve, give uh, participants information about who they are so they can make clear, conscious decisions about how to modify behavior. And, and if I may tie that diagnostic assessment piece to too, is that we should always, when we look at uh, the profiles, the first question you should always ask, and I hope this is one of the key, uh, key takeaways from this webinar, you should always ask, can I trust the results? And I promise by the end of the webinar, I'll show you how you can interpret that from the from the profiles. Yeah, especially if you're talking about that you may actually use the disk results to find out what a person might be feeling. How would I even know that? So that is something you're going to talk about later in the webinar. Yeah, not to get to that. Of course, again, this is not a certification where we spend a little, you know several hours on how to interpret profiles, <laughs> but hopefully I can give you some ideas here today. Okay, so um, now that we've just kind of gotten the overview why don't we just go ahead and jump in and start talking about the profile. Is that okay with you? Sounds good. Okay. So here we have the two uh, famous extended disk profiles. <laughs> and by the way, uh, with this new platform, um, you don't have to include the profiles in the reports. I mean, if you have only 90 minutes to spend with the group of people, you probably don't want to jump into profiles. And as you know, Christine, a lot of our clients only uh, focus on identifying somebody's style, maybe in terms of you are 55% of D, 45% of I. Mm -hmm. So don't th feel that profiles always must be included in the report. Participants don't know what's supposed to be there. Also, if you only want to show profile two or only profile one, that's also possible. But, you know, profile two and one do provide, obviously, more information about the, who the person is. So can you just give us a quick overview when you talk about profile one and profile two? What, what's the difference? Well, profile two, that's the national style. That is that hardwired behavioral style. Mm -hmm. That is really what we are focusing on. I used to have this rule, 90-10 rule, meaning that I would put 90% of my focus on profile two and 10% to profile one. But maybe five years ago, I changed that to 99-1 rule. I focus on profile two almost exclusively. Profile one is nice to know. Mm -hmm. In certain situations, like maybe you're working with a team, it's nice to know how the team members adjust together. Mm -hmm. It might be helpful, kind of help me understand if the manager is being clear about communicating, et cetera. But the bottom line here is focus on profile two because that is the hardwired natural style that remains quite stable over a person's adult lifetime. Okay, so um, I see these lines. Mm -hmm. What do they mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, the way the profile we interpret the profiles is that obviously on the top we have the four distals, D, I, S, and C. And below of those styles we have the axis. And higher somebody is in any of those axes, more comfortable they are with that behavioral style. And the way we identify somebody's distal, for example, we say the D, I style, we look at the behavioral styles that are above the middle line. Mm -hmm. And the middle line is that line that divides the profile into the top and bottom halves. In this example, we are looking at our friend Suzanne. Mm -hmm. And in her profile too, there are two styles that are above the middle line. The highest is the D, which is almost to the very top in that upper zone, followed by I style. So we would identify that person as being a D I style. However, the behavioral styles that are below the line are also important, mm -hmm. especially if something is particularly low, because that kind of behavioral style requires uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, energy, and that can be sometimes very important for us to know. But in, in this case, it doesn't mean that this person, Suzanne, doesn't have any SOC style. But the, when you look at the relationship among the, all four styles, C and S are clearly more challenging behavioral styles, requiring more effort, more energy. So see here what Marku is saying is that the graph line represents your disk style. It intersects at all four axes. What it ha intersects in the top half is your natural style. What intersects in the bottom half are also part of your styles, but they are the styles that are not natural to you. Does that sound right? That sounds exactly right. And, and I, I like, Christina, the way you explained the mm -hmm. middle line, because I think that kind of gives a more clear picture why that those behavioral styles below the middle line are also important. Yeah, I always like to explain to people, you know, I usually go through what Marku and I just discussed, and then when they kind of give me that look like, I kind of get it, I like to go to my visual, which is think of the middle line as the surface of the water. Anything that is above the surface of the water is what you see, like the ducks, like alligators, like the plants that stick out of the water. 
Same with the disc styles. You see the D style, you most likely will see the D style and the I style behaviors in this individual. What's below the surface of the water, it exists. Well, for instance, fish. We know they're down there. We just don't see it. Same thing with the S and C style in this individual. Um, she has it. But unless she uses concentration and focus to bring up those particular styles, we typically don't see those behaviors in her. Yeah, I, I think that's a very great way to explain it. So for Suzanne, S and C styles are still there. Mm -hmm. It just takes more effort for us to find those behaviors. So now we look at the profile two again. This remains quite stable. Mm -hmm. Profile one is how the person perceives she needs to adjust her style in order for her to succeed in the present environment. So it's specific to a point in time, the date at when the person took, uh, completed the questionnaire. So when people retake the questionnaire over time, what we expect to see is that profile two remains stable. Mm -hmm. Profile one almost always will change. Not every single time, but almost always. And the reason it will change because the environment has changed. Maybe there's a new team members, new boss, maybe even new job priorities, goals have changed, and what behaviors are going to make that person successful have changed, and the person perceives different pressure, pressures to adjust that behavior. So profile two remains stable, profile one will change. And, and one more thing about the profile two, people ask, well, somebody took the questionnaire again and there's some changes. There might be some, but typically not a, a whole lot. But my rule of thumb is that I trust the first profile first for this reason. When people complete the questionnaire the first time, you know, there's those 24 questions and each question has those four options with the word pairs. When they see words like, let's say, talkative and open, mm -hmm. they're simply words. Now they get the assessment. They get great this training from a facilitator. They understand what the distals are all about. Maybe over time they complete the questionnaire again. And now when they see those words talkative and open, they are no longer just words. Now they are I style descriptors. And sometimes that can create a little bit of a distraction, if you will. That's a great point. So if you have someone who has two results in your database, it's better to go with the first one. Yeah, I always like to look at both, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I tend to trust the, both, the first one the, the most. Okay. Um, so profile one is a snapshot in time. Who do you feel you need to bring to work at the time you took the assessment? That's so, right. Now that we know about... Um, these lines and the graphs represents your distyles. Um, a question I also often get asked is, what are those numbers below the profiles? Can you talk more about that? Sure, that's a great question. And, and the, the numbers are simply another way to identify somebody's distyles, the profile two and profile one distyles. Uh, the top row, of, and by the way, these are percentages. So mm -hmm. the rows will always add to 100%. So if you look at profile two, the top row, we see numbers 55, 45. It shows the relationship among the styles that are above the middle line. Mm -hmm. The bottom row shows the relationship of these styles, in this case, S and C, that are below the middle line. So they will always add to 100. So what it, this tells me that Suzanne's the relationship among the behavioral styles that are most comfortable to her, it is 55% of D, 45% of I. The numbers below tell me that when it comes to behavioral styles that require more energy from her, C is the one that requires the most energy, 55%, 45% relationship between the styles that are more demanding for her. So that top row you're saying she would be 55% D and 45% I, and because S and C don't intersect in the top half of the graph, that's why they're showing zero and zero in the top row. Yeah, if something is below the line, mm -hmm. it automatically will get a zero on the top row. And of course, vice versa, if something is above the line, it's going to get a zero on the bottom row. And here, this is actually a pretty good example here because if you look at the profile one, mm -hmm. notice that uh, her D is 100%. And if you notice, it's at a pretty much the same level as in profile two. Mm -hmm. And it's, this, again, is an illustration that these numbers are not a how high or low you are in a particular scale. Because when it comes to behaviors, we cannot use normative absolute scale. There is no maximum D behavior that you can achieve. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I even, particularly with D style, hey, I score <laughs> yeah, 98. I was say, well, I'm at the top of the graph. I'm, I'm the total D. Yeah, or, or I'm a 99% D. I mean, like they almost, if they just work a little bit harder, they get to the ultimate D level. Yeah. You have to look at the relationship always. What the DISC behavioral style model is all about, 
our preferences among these four styles. And in this case, in profile one, it gets 100% because it's the only one above the middle line. Exactly. By the way, it would have gotten 100 no matter how high above the middle line it is because the only one it still would have gotten 100. Right. So you're saying it could be in that upper white section and it would still be 100% because I always tell people it's not just the fact that this person said, I'm 100% D. They're also saying that there are three styles in which they don't feel they need to be, which is pushing it below the line, leaving only one style above the line. That's correct. So, okay, well, great. Thank you for explaining the numbers. Um, how do um, oh, how do I take these profiles and and look at it on a diamond? Because that's also in the report as well. Yeah, let's look at that. And, and um, when we uh, go to the next slide here. <laughs> We'll try to go to the next slide. So the diamond is just another way to show somebody's style. Let me get a little technical issue here. Yeah, always. Let's see. There we go. There we okay. go. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> so here we are, friends who stand, same profiles, DI 55, 45% in profile two, 100% in D in profile one. Basically what the diamond is, it's a map. It's mapped to have a final locations of different types of profiles in the four quarter model. Now remember that profiles will always give us the most specific and clear identification of somebody's behavioral style. Not only that, it can detect those underlying feelings and emotions we mentioned earlier in this webinar, like frustration, stress, and so on. But sometimes uh, diamond is more helpful and, and a clear way of looking at behavioral yeah. styles, especially when we're working with teams. Um, so, for example, here we have Suzanne, who's a D style. The reason she, her uh, profile two, which is the starting point of the arrow. Again, remember, profile two is starting point of the arrow is in the D quadrant. The reason for that is because the D is her highest behavioral style, most comfortable to her. Mm -hmm. So whatever is the highest in profile two, that will determine the starting point quadrant of, 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 of the arrow. So in this case, she falls into the area of the diamond that corresponds to a DI profile, in particular to uh, what we call a 55, 45% DI profile. That is the reason it's fairly close to that I quadrant. Now, profile one is the tip of the arrow. And because Suzanne has 100% of D, that is the reason she's based, uh, placed in that very top right-hand corner. So what, what Suzanne really perceives that in order for me to be successful in my work environment, I need to be less... Uh, less uh, I, and therefore the arrow points that she's moving away from the I quadrant. So just in summary, so the first thing, that macro level, again, we look and see what quadrant she's in, and she's in the D quadrant. So I don't even have to look at the profiles on the left. I can see that Suzanne is going to be a dominant D, and then um, the specific sections break up the quadrants themselves to tell you what specific the style that you are. That's right. There's many different types of D profiles, mm -hmm. and depending on what kind of D profile we're dealing with, that will determine where in that quadrant she or he will be placed. So you said the beginning point of the arrow is profile two. The tip of the arrow is profile one, where she feels she needs to be. We talked about the direction of the arrow. Where mm -hmm. does she move to and where does she move away from? There's that one component I always talk about, too, which is the length of the arrow. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, the length of the arrow really defines or identifies, as you say, the conscious need to adjust behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, longer the arrow is, greater the need to adjust the behavior is. So let's assume for a moment that Suzanne's profile one, let's say we're very high S profile. If that ha happened to be the case, the tip of the arrow would be in all the way that bottom left corner in that S quadrant. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that Suzanne really perceives a need to adjust her behavior to a pretty great extent. Think about somebody who's a DI style. You know, I'm a D, fast pace, et cetera, like to be in control, like to make the decisions, uh, like to move from one thing to the next routine. It's boring to me. But <laughs> she perceives a need to be more S style, who likes things steady, stable, work with a team uh, at a steady pace and make sure we're doing things completely. Doesn't mean Suzanne can't do it. Mm -hmm but it takes more energy. So longer the arrow, greater the need to adjust, and typically it means that the person is spending more mental calories to make that change. Great summary. Um, so I know Marku is going to talk about this more, but 
I know he always reminds us and tells us trainers all is the, when you first look at the profiles, ask yourself, can you trust the results? Look at the, the, what visually, what does the line look like? That tall, vertically stretched graph. So that's right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that moment. I'll show how visually you can tell when the, the results are really valid. Okay. So now that we can see how it shows up um, on the diamond, let's talk a little bit more about profile one. Yeah. Inter when we interpret profile one, there's a couple of things we need to remember. Again, the first question is, can I trust the result? Mm -hmm. When I look at this person's profile too, it has this nice wide shape, S and C are clearly above the line, I is clearly below the line. So I feel good about how consistently this person answered the questionnaire. But always looking at, um, when you look at profiles, again, look at profile two first. Remember the 99, 1% rule. So this is who the person really is. In this particular example, this individual, we would define her as being an SC profile because those uh, styles are above the middle line. And when I interpret profile one, I must always compare it to the profile two. And the reason for that is that, in essence, profile one has no context or meaning without profile two. Because remember, profile one identifies how I need to adjust my behavior to be successful in my present environment. So profile two tells me where I'm adjusting from. So it's like your base point. That's my base point. So that's why we have to always compare profile one, profile two. And when we do make those comparisons, there are basically two kind of changes we can see. The first one is that uh, any of the distals may move down. In this particular example, S, that is the highest in profile two, in fact, becomes the lowest in profile one. That's a pretty significant change. So the S style here moved down. And when that happens, we say that the person perceives that that type of behavior is not value or is not motivated. So in more practical terms for this individual, this person probably feels that working um, uh, maybe in a team setting or you know, really taking my time to do, make sure that I do step by step everything, that that, that kind of behavior is not going to create success for me. Maybe I need to speed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that, again, is that if something moves down, person perceives that kind of behavior is not going to make me successful. It's not value. It's not motivated. It's not uh, really supported. The second kind of behavioral change, of course, would be that one of the distals or more of the distals would move up. And here we have D style moving up. When that happens, simply what it means is that person perceives that there is a need to emphasize that kind of behavioral style. Mm -hmm. So again, so remember these two things. Something moves down, person perceives it's not going to make me successful, that behavior is not value, supported, motivated. If something goes up, hey, I perceive I need to increase that behavioral style. That's it. And then also, could you just clarify for some of us, when we see the visual, the styles move up and down, but they never break the surface of the middle line. Is that something that we pay attention to? Well, the, the most significant change we look for is one is, is there a change in the primary style? Like mm -hmm. this person, the primary style was uh, S, it's no longer the primary style. If you think in terms of diamond, basically this person's diamond, uh, the, I'm sorry, the arrow started in the S quadrant, it ended up in the C quadrant. Mm -hmm. That's noticeable change. Second is, if something moves clearly to the other side of the middle line, um, that's uh, something we pay attention to. For example, here we look at the eye style, for example. It was the lowest in profile, too. It moved up a little bit. Honestly, I would not consider that to be that significant change. I would not really pay attention to it. Yeah, because one of the things I say is it's like that fish. It's swimming around underwater, and it can move around to different positions, but you typically won't see it because it doesn't come to a visible point. And, and here again, remember we started that we always need to look at the relationship among all four styles. Mm -hmm. When we are interpreting the changes, we st still need to do the same because when I look at the movement of I style from moving up a little bit from being the lowest, in relationship of all the other changes, it's not that significant. So, so I focus on the most significant changes first. So what assumptions can we make about this person? He's, we see that, I mean, she, she's reserved. She's an SC naturally. But when I look at her profile one, she's saying, I need to be a CD. What, can we make any assumptions about her? Well, we have to be very careful not to jump into conclusions because I don't want to conclude that because of the change, she must be doing this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This person lives these profiles every day, so she wouldn't be able to tell me what's happening. But on a kind of a big picture and general level, I can see, probably conclude that this person, uh, because that changes that S style, S being the highest, becoming the lowest, 
we're really moving away from the bottom half of the disk model. You know, being moving away from the people behaviors mm -hmm. and moving toward the task behaviors, being a CD style. So, for example, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this person said something like that. Uh, I work in um, on many projects with the very uh, clear critical deadlines, where it's a very task oriented environment where I may have to work more alone than in a team settings. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I say something like that typically when i see something like this the person perceives that they maybe need to move a little bit faster work a little bit more alone in less team settings i don't suppose that sounds familiar to you and that gives me in a close enough ballpark that the person will respond assuming they have, we have a good rapport going that well it's not quite like that really what it is and then they explain it to you and now they have the disk model and we have defined the different kind of behaviors now they actually can kind of verbalize to themselves why they believe they need to make those kind of adjustments to succeed. That's great. So ask those open-ended questions because they'll tell you. Yeah, because if you tell them that this must be happening, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. They know what it means. You just need to facilitate them to be able to verbalize and define what those behavioral modifications mean in practice. So I think in summary, I always say, you as the trainer or coach, you can technically interpret. You can show them where the profile shows going up or down, but you need them to fill in the rest. That's right. Okay. So um, you earlier you mentioned about validity, and you promised us you were going to talk about it. Is that something you can talk about now? Yeah, let's conclude with that. And this is something that I I, I see that people kind of miss this point fairly often. Hmm. And, and if we think about the online questionnaire, there are 24 questions, and each question has four options, what, what describes you the most and what describes you the least. And we ask the same question over and over. And really what the question is, who are you and who are you not? Mm -hmm. Who are you is that most response? Who are you not is that least response? And we want to ask it over and over because we want to find consistency in the answering pattern. The more consistently the person answers, the more valid results we have. So if you think about this kind of a continuum from having very consistent answering and very reliable result, and on the other end, we would have a person doesn't answer very consistently, and we don't have as reliable result. This is how it will show up on the profiles. And you're talking about profile two, correct? Th thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about profile two because that identifies the person's style. Look at this particular example. See how tight that profile is? Mm -hmm. So what it meant in practice when person was answering the questionnaire, maybe question one, they say, I'm a D. Question two, I'm an S. Question three, I'm a C, and so on. Very all over the place. So we cannot validly identify who the person is. And in fact, what happens is that when a profile is very tight, our system will not even generate a report. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that people make sometimes very important decisions about what to do with this information? How should I modify my behavior? What can I do to become more effective as a leader or a salesperson and so on? If we know that we don't know how valid the results are, we have a moral obligation not to provide anything. Um, you know, it's best to ask the person to complete it again. They might have been distracted. Who knows what happened? But we want to provide valid information. Now, as the person begins to answer more consistently, notice how the profile becomes wider and wider. The profile all the way to the right there, D and I all, are all the way that upper zone. S and C are clearly below the line. The person really could not have answered much more clearly and consistently. So the wider the profile is, more valid the results are. If the profile is tied, like let's say the second one from the left, it doesn't mean that the person is not a DI style. But I need to look for confirmation of that. Uh, I need to be a little bit more cautious of that. It could be that person was simply distracted when they completed the questionnaire. But it could also mean that something significant is happening in the person's life at the time. For example, let's say they concern concerned about their future in terms of financial security, maybe illness of a loved one, um, maybe they are ill or going through a divorce. Those kind of significant life events and stressful situations can influence how a person answers the questionnaire. And we need to be more cautious. So you're saying the, the taller vertically stretched the more consistent they have, have identified with the disc style, the more we can trust the results. However, if it's more compressed or tight, as you are showing on the left side, um, you need to ask more questions. And just, I always like to throw in, you know, us as trainers, you know, anytime you have questions, you get profiles like this and you don't quite know what to do with it, 
we're here for you. So yeah, and, and the worst, best way to learn the profiles is to put a face with the profile and, and talk it with our coaches. But when you look at this validity issue here, I would say the last three profiles to the right, those mm -hmm. are all very, very valid profiles. Even the third one from the left, I feel pretty good about it. I will look at the profile one and see if that has a similar shape, and that will give me a confirmation that hey. It's I can trust the results. And even the profile, second from the left, it might be valid that this person is a DI. Mm -hmm. I just need to look a little bit deeper. So if you go back to that MRI analogy, the one on the right is a very, very clear, crisp image. Mm -hmm. When I'm going on the left, my image is a little blurry, and I may want to get another MRI before I start the operation. Double check it. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be at the top of the graph for it to be a valid result. That's correct. Okay. Anything else you want to just add and just kind of as we close this webinar about profiles? Well, I mean, it, it takes practice to, learn, to uh, excuse me, interpret profiles. And um, there's many, many um, layers to in interpreting profiles. And it just takes a little practice. And, and um, the best way to, to learn it is just to do it. <laughs> <laughs> just like, just keep talking. Just ignore right. me. All Technical right. difficulties. So, um it just takes some practice, but the best way to learn literally is to put a face with the profile, especially with the profiles that are not as common. I actually think of a person. For example, DS profiles are not as common. For that, I have a couple of individuals I think about when I'm trying to interpret the results that how would that person behave in this situation? Mm. And that makes it helpful to me. I'm not saying that everybody needs to do that. It's right. just something I use. Find what works for you. That's right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. This is our last webinar of 2016. We will start fresh again, beginning of January. Um, Wilma and myself, the senior trainers here at Extended Disc, will be doing a one-hour workshop um, or webinar entitled, What is Disc? And this is actually targeted for um, if you are interested in just getting just walking through a introduction to disc how do you introduce disc to in your workshops um, to new employee orientation it happens also to be um, hrci accredited so you will get a one hour general credit for attendance it'll be on january 11th um, 2017 from 9 30 to 10 30 we'll send out information as well um, thank you all for joining us and we wish you a very happy holidays thank you marku you're welcome happy holidays everybody all right take care everyone